Hi, I'm Tanya Thompson, creator and executive producer of Nightlight, a horror podcast featuring creepy tales from Black writers all over the world. This week, we've got a great story for you if you loved the movie The Matrix. But first, this episode is brought to you by the Nightlight Legion. Special thanks to our newest patrons, Naomi and Amy. Thank you so much for joining us. Nightlight is 100% listener-supported, so we need your help to keep bringing you new episodes. Just go to patreon.com slash nightlightpod to join the Nightlight Legion and get a shout-out on the podcast. Now sit back, turn out the lights, and enjoy Null Void by Multimind, narrated by Sheree Stewart. The day was bright, breezy, and clear by the Riverside Park. For well over a mile, the park stretched along with verdant fields, dotted with sprigs and sprouts of flowers and blossoms. Children played, students studied or napped. Fishermen sat on the cement river walls as old music drifted from their small radios. The air carried the brackish, heavy smell of the river. Love pedaled down the winding sidewalk as the wind danced in her short, silver-blue box braids. The chain of her black mountain bike whirred quietly as she pressed on. The bike was set a gear higher than normal, for exercise, something Love got so little of on her new job. As Love strolled, seagulls sailed overhead. One glitched. Love squeaked to a trailing stop at the edge of the sidewalk. She gave her kickstand a couple of knocks from her booted heel. Rust flittered from the hinge. Love sat back on her wide, rainbow-striped seat as her chest heaved and sweat gleamed across her dark, rose-brown forehead. The wind did little to soothe her. She wiped her brow with the hem of her shirt. Her lime bootlace glitched. Love stretched her arms, but her head buzzed with a quick shot of static. It sounded like television snow. She scrunched her hazel eyes and shook her head. It glitched with jaunty flow. Spots of television snow crackled in her ears. Love opened her eyes and blinked hard several times to regain herself. I must really be stressed out and way out of shape, she thought. Love pinched the wide bridge of her nose. She had only started her job a couple of months ago, but she didn't think it burdened her this bad. Behind her on the river ledge, a waiting fisherman reeled in his rod. His reeling arms sped up and jumped frames with boxy colors and dead pixels. It returned to normal when he used his reeling arm to check the volume of the radio. Festive samba piped out crystal clear and unfettered. Love's braids clattered around her ears as she took a deep breath and shook her head again. She pedaled off, but skidded to a hard stop when the world glitched again. Colored bars and dead pixels invaded her view. Love looked down at her plump hands as a sharp headache needled her temple. They appeared fine, and the headache dropped away. I must really be stressed out, Love thought to herself as she rubbed her temple. She kicked off to ride again, slower this time. Never had this happened to her, not even when she was at the lowest of her depression. Love knew her job as an office grunt tired her, but she didn't think it was to this extent. If anything, she thought most of her worrying days were over. She focused on the wind rushing past her and the steady, cautious whir of her chain as she surveyed the world around her. Nothing was out of place. No one seemed curious or suspicious. Everything was absolutely normal. The world that you know is not available right now. Rebooting world now. What? The world that you know is not available right now. Rebooting world now. A surging column of bubbling white light dropped over love as she pedaled fast. Everything went dark. World rebooted. World rebooted. Love woke up bleary with bleeding pain between her temples. Tropical branches poked her thick legs and torso. Fanned leaves rustled around her, and a thin smattering of amber sap rubbed onto the shoulder of her salmon shirt as she sorted herself. Love could barely focus her eyes. Through her blurry view, she saw that the hard ground was distant, streaked with shadows and scattered with rocks. The only thing clear was that should she slip, it would be an awful landing. Her vision became a little clearer on the second blink. The humidity was clammy and thick, difficult to breathe. It reminded her of her visit to New Orleans as a child, but just a touch cooler. She wanted a breeze to soothe her, but she didn't want to fall all the same. Insects buzzed past her ears and birds clattered overhead. What happened? Love's words reverberated in her head with agony. She started to slip, 
Her hand shot out to grab a sapling branch. The smooth leaves left a light sap coat on her palm as she gripped it, but the branch was hardly enough to support anything beyond itself. With a slow crackle and rasp, the branch began to part from the thick trunk with a long strip of vibrant emerald peeling into existence. Love heard the pops and whines as the branch gave way. No, 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 she pled as she slid backward. She tried to renew her grip on the sapling. The sudden grasp dropped her through the maze of vines and boughs. Love's back struck the ground with a heavy thud. She was out again. Cool water erupted across Love's face. She gasped for air as she rolled over onto her side. She hacked and spat as the water burned her sinuses. The dust made her bluster even more. What you going to do that for? A woman's voice chided from behind love. She wake, ain't she? A younger man rebuked from beside her. Hey, you all right? How could she be? You tried to drown her. And back up, you too close. The male voice had some distance. She wasn't waking up. Hey, is that your bike? Hey. Love shifted to her stomach, heaving for breath. Her broad nose still burned and the world was a heavy blur again. She didn't understand what was going on, but she knew she didn't want to stay. She attempted to crawl away. The forest floor clung to her arms and tugged at her body. Hey! The male voice practically shouted overhead. Where's you going? You tried to kill her, that's what, said the woman. Ground cover quickly crunched by her. Through her blurry eyes were red shoes and thin, dark brown ankles. Love squinted and fluttered her eyes, scooted back a little, and hacked some more (coughs) from the disturbed soil. Cooler air washed over her back, but it wasn't enough. The owner of the red shoes knelt down. It was the woman. We're safe, honey, she assured. We're not going to do anything to you. Love started to make out the woman's white capris. Her dirtied half-apron slumped from her lap onto the ground. Her navy striped shirt. She had a styled pate of honey red hair, and gold earrings lined her earlobes. I'm Venti. I ain't gonna let nothing happen to you, okay? That over there is, uh... Hey, what's your name again? Arnez, he answered. His voice was marked with agitation. That's Arnez, Venti said. Do you remember how you got here? Love gazed blankly up at Venti's face. Her face was long and sharp, marked with a bright creased smile. Then Love looked over her shoulder. There stood a tall boy with a high top fade in a white choir robe. Love still couldn't make out his face. She returned to Venti. Her mind was still reeling. With a gathered breath, she screamed and crawled sideways towards the tree she fell from. Venti fell onto her rear, clapping her ears shut. Arnez plugged his ears and turned away. The buttress of roots gave no shelter, but Love curled herself against them all the same and screamed more. Coughs broke through her screeches, and her lungs were tired. Her throat burned. Love sputtered. Who, who are you people? I want to go home. (coughs) I want to go home. I want to go home. A quick cough shook her body. What do you want from me? Take me home. Arnez rubbed his ears. Jeez, you're loud. We could say the same to you. I don't know her and I don't know you. I was in church when I got sent here. Venti muttered to herself as she got up and dusted herself off. I still can't believe that. Love looked at Arnez. Her vision was better. She could see the youthfulness in his round, dimpled face and the swirls cut into his fade. His dark, hazel eyes were cut with annoyance under his thick eyebrows. Quieter, Love hesitated. Are, are you an angel? Nah, Arnez answered. He sucked his teeth. And I doubt this ain't heaven neither. Venti scoffed. How would you know? She folded her arms. Arnez replied. Man, I don't think God sounds like a computer program. Where does it say that in the Bible? Boy, how old are you? Venti interrupted. You don't look a day over 12 to me, talking like you grown. I'm 19, Arnez declared. How old is you? 32, and the owner of a five-star restaurant. Venti pointed at Arnez with a sharp, gold-tipped finger. Keep cutting lip at me like that and you gonna die for real, you hear? You heard a computer voice? Love asked. She cleared her throat before she continued. Where were y'all when y'all got sent? Did y'all see a light or something? Venti answered. I was in the kitchen of my restaurant. She rolled her eyes and jutted a thumb at Arnez. This boy said he was in church when he was taken. Arnez shot a scalding look at Venti and patted his robe. I'm on the choir. Why is that so hard to believe? Because I've only known you for five minutes and I can already tell there ain't not a single godly thing about you, Venti jeered. Your mama makes you go to keep an eye on you, don't she? No, she don't. 
Arnez stomped. A small cloud plumed around his foot. I'm first baritone. She works downstairs with the old folks. Venti smirked. Whatever you say. She turned to love. I was in my kitchen, filling orders, and then I saw this crazy light. I found myself laid out on the side of the beach on a rock, looking at the sea. Then I ran into Arnez here when I started looking around, and I just noticed I never got your name. What is it? Love switched her gaze between Venti and Arnez. The chef kept a thin veneer of calm, but her arms were still folded. It was the first time she noticed how tall and lanky Venti was, especially compared to Arnez. He was fleshier and shorter by a head. Though the chef had her disarming smile, the choir boy couldn't hide his agitation. His face twisted with disdain. Um, my name is Love. Venti was charmed. Oh, what a lovely name. Thank you. My dad gave it to me. Love cracked a soft smile. She was still unsure of everything, but at least she wasn't alone. Everyone calls me Venti, cause that was my nickname in culinary school back when I was studying in Italy. I think everyone just couldn't get Shanika right, so it was Venti instead. Hell of a lot better than Mocha. Arnez asked, what do you make? Even with simple questions, he came off cross. Venti replied at love. I make pastas and pastries. If we ever get out of this place, I will treat. The chef pointed at Arnez, but you better bring your mama, you hear? Arnez sucked his teeth and looked away. Venti rolled her eyes and asked Love, Where was you when all this went down? Love thought for a moment. I was out riding my bike. Struck by the reminder, she looked around. She spotted her bike past Arnez's swaying robe. Pointing it out, she declared, That one, that's my bike. Not too far beyond them. The front wheel of Love's bike rolled with the current in the surging low river as slushes of water washed over the half-submerged frame. I was riding it and my head started hurting and... Me too! Arnez jumped. He patted his chest, his grand sleeves exaggerating his every movement. I got a headache before I came here, too. The world started going crazy like I was in a crashing video game or something for a little bit, and then I heard some big old computer voice. Then I wound up here, sitting on a rock in the middle of the forest, staring at some sand like I was still in the pew. I honestly thought I died for real. Love asked Arnez, how do you know we're not dead now? World reset. Please wait for package loads. World reset. Please wait for package loads. Everyone paused. They looked at the sky through the dense canopy. Everything was clear and normal. Venti looked back at the two. We should probably leave. Arnez scrunched his face in confusion. To where? Sounds like this voice is all over the whole place, wherever we are. And what is this package load? I don't know. Venti shrugged. She started toward Love's bike to fish it out of the river. But I ain't trying to find out just standing around. I woke up on the beach and... The bike was stubborn to move. The rushing water made it slick against the rocks, but she still tried. I plan, I plan to go back there to make a raft and leave. Venti managed to shake loose the bike and drag it onto the land. The chef called out, Lovey, I got your bike out. She pulled the bike upright. Y'all can do what you like, but I ain't staying. I'm out of this place. Venti grasped the handlebars and steered the bike towards Love, carefully so not to get caught by one of the spinning pedals. Love pushed up from the buttress of roots. She staggered a bit from the head rush. The humidity dropped. She felt like she could breathe again. Flecks of earth clung to her front and back. She brushed her arms and legs so the dusting didn't amount to much more than streaking the dirt. Walking to Venti, Love decided, if we ever leave, I'm just gonna live in the shower. Before Love could reach Venti, Arnez cried to the skies with cupped hands. Hey, hey, who is you? Why you bring us here? Can you send us back? Boy, shush! Venti hissed and abandoned Love's bike to wrap an arm around his shoulder and clap a hand over his mouth. Love darted to save her fallen bike as it clattered to the ground. Have you lost your mind? We don't know anything about that big voice above. We need to get moving. Lifeform.exe detected. Users available. The world that you know is not available right now. Please try again later. Package load 21%. Please wait. As the voice repeated itself, Venti muttered, Let's go, and rewrapped an arm around Arnez's waist to drag him toward the line of tall grass beyond the trees. His robe swallowed her arm as he twisted and wriggled. His heels carved pocks and grooves into the ground. Venti called over to Love. Don't wait around, okay? Follow us. She stepped through the tall grass with a careful foot. Muffled anger seeped from behind her hand. Boy, you better not be cursing, she warned as they waded through the tall growth. Love cast her eyes above one more time. The sky was still clear and normal. Love picked up her bike and hopped on. 
She kicked off and pedaled with all her might but didn't get far. The terrain was too much to handle. Only inches from the foliage line she hopped off, worn from the attempt. Love pushed her bike and the pedals clipped her calf and scraped at her shin with muddy swipes. She stopped to check for blood. There was only broken skin, but the pain seared all the same. This thing is killing me, she agonized. The thought to leave her bike flashed across her mind. She could hear the distance she was losing between herself and the hurried duo ahead. Her bike was built to take on such difficult terrains. She wasn't. She craned her neck and strained her ears to listen. Guys? She called out. Nothing. Worried, Love dragged her bike into the thicket. The foliage enveloped her the further she went in, following the soft trail of trodden blades. Vegetation got caught in her gears and spokes the deeper she went in. No matter how much she pulled or yanked, it just got stuck again. Her chain and gears were filled with crushed and broken blades. Love stumbled down from another hidden dip. Her bike clattered atop her, pinning her between the pedal and the handlebars. The tail reflector glitched. Love pushed the bike away, its frame laid onto her side. This thing is just too dang heavy. She pushed the bike further with her heavy boots. I'ma just have to leave it and hope don't nothing happen to it. Heaving for breath, Love propped herself up and looked at the sky. It was still beautiful and calm. The sun was almost overhead. Guys? Love called out. Still nothing. Love strained herself as she got up. I gotta keep going. I gotta keep moving. She parted the grass like a swimmer and stepped through. Did I get abandoned? Was everyone taken again? The burdensome terrain was easier to handle without the bike. With a dive, Love clamped a foot out of the long grass and happened into a dead marshland. This world was gray. The overcast sky hung over the swampy quicksand mudflat. Dead, ashen trees were held aloft above the thin sheet of water by their twisted, tortured roots. They stood like petrified bodies. Love stood on the cracked and dusty dry land as she surveyed about. A little help here, shouted Arnez from the distance. Love looked around. What is you looking at? Over here. You're right, Arnez screeched. Love treaded carefully along the stark swamp line toward his voice. She could see Arnez and Venti through the dead branches of a couple of trees and ran to them. Trapped in the quicksand, Venti was sunk halfway to her knees as she pushed at Arnez's lower back. Arnez teetered forward, struggling to keep his balance as he kept his choir robe bundled in his arms. He wasn't deep, only a bit past his ankles, and his feet churned in small steps. It was evident to love what had happened, but not why. The pattern of rushing feet and late skidding from the long grass to the swamp as it transitioned from dust to mud. They were close to the edge of dry land, but not close enough. We're stuck! Venti yelled to love. She pressed harder against Arnez's lower back, but she could hardly keep her own balance. This mud keeps sucking us in. Find a branch and pull us out. Love looked about, frantic. The world was dead and brittle, nothing strong or durable in sight. A subtle breeze kicked up a draft of dust, a pebble glitched by her boot. I can't find anything, Love yelled back. She instead stuck out an arm. Take my hand, Venti lashed out. Love, are you crazy? You'll get pulled in. As Venti fussed, Arnez leaned forward and hooked her fingertips with a couple of tries. A socked foot gave a loud suck when it popped from his submerged sneaker as he teetered forward. His foot squished back into the soft earth with a sickening squelch. He sucked his teeth. Man, ugh. He tried to get another hand around Love's wrist, dropping his choir robe completely. His body was bent over, jostling forward from Venti's every push. This mud feels disgusting, and this pose feels weird. Venti, watch your hands. Venti didn't care. You're a choir boy. I'm sure you've been in this pose ugh, tons of times. This is just the first, ugh, the first time you won't yell, father, father in the inn. Now don't drag love in. The more she strained to push Arnez, the more she sank herself. Before Arnez could reply, Love asked, How'd y'all get trapped in this? Venti pushed me, Arnez accused. Boy, you ran into this yourself when you tried to get out of my grasp, Venti cried. I got stuck in this trying to get you out. If I had more sense, I would have just kept walking. Watch your hands. Arnez yelped when Venti's palm slipped to his waist and hip to steady herself. Trust me, I am. There's no way I want to grab a little kid. Venti volleyed back. You're just about the same age as my brother. Just stop struggling. That's probably why you're sinking so fast. 
She resumed pushing on his lower back. Her feet sank deeper. I wish Miss Big Voice would get us out of here. Arnez yelled to the sky. I can't get out. Arnez tried to pull up his shoe-clad foot. It came up a little, but not enough. He forced it down again for balance. An air bubble burped to the surface beside his leg. One of Venti's gold nails glitched when she checked her footing. A quick dizzy spell swept through love. She lost her grasp for a moment. Arnez grew alarmed. What's wrong? He exclaimed. You're not pulling. A small wave of lightheadedness took him as well. He blinked his eyes hard to regain himself. Why are you not pulling? Love shook her head and tried to continue as Venti checked. Love, you all right? Looked like you got a little winded there. Venti flinched from the sharp twinge at her temple. Something's happening, I think. We gotta get out faster. I'm try. I'm trying. Love strained with renewed strength. She saw the loop tag on the back of her boot glitch. Her shoulders burned like they were going to tear from the sockets. She did not see Venti's head glitch. She was so focused on Arnez. Arnez made little ground forward, but quite a bit more ground downward. I'm still sinking! A small cross on his robe glitched and flashed dead pixels, as did Venti's head. It sped up and distorted when she turned it. Fatal error detected. System crash. System crash. Deleting world's library. Now to reinstall. Reinstalling world. Everyone yelled in terror, but it was cut short with a bright flash of light. System reboot. System reboot. Package loading. Please wait. New world.exe starting. Please wait. Old files corrupted. Performing system dump. New files created. New world.exe started. We apologize for the inconvenience. Would you like to send a report? Would you like to send a report? Waiting for user input. Waiting for user input. No user detected. No user detected. Thanks again to our patrons for supporting this podcast. Because of your support, listeners around the world get creepy stories in their ears every other week. If you want new episodes every week, the only way for that to happen is to join the Nightlight Legion by going to patreon.com slash nightlightpod and support this podcast. You can also make a donation via PayPal at paypal.me slash nightlightpodcast. If you're unable to support us financially, word of mouth is the next best way to help. Give us a shout out online on Twitter or Instagram at nightlightpod or like us on Facebook at nightlightpod. Reviews are also a huge help, so be sure to leave a few kind words on your podcast platform of choice. Audio production for this episode by Jen Zink. You can visit her at jenzink.wordpress.com or follow her on Twitter at Looptilu to thank her for volunteering to make Nightlight amazing. And to thank you for listening until the very end, we have a creepy fact for you. Most of you have probably heard of the simulation theory. It's the idea that we aren't living in a natural world, but rather in a simulation, just like this story or The Matrix. What you may not know is that a theoretical physicist named S. James Gate has observed computer code in the mathematics that describes our universe. That's right, computer code. So are we living in a simulation? Thanks for joining us, and before we go, we wanted to give you a little taste of a new podcast called Afro Horror. Have a listen, and if you like it, subscribe. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. It's a dumbass white movie about some dumbass white girls getting their white asses cut the fuck up, okay? Yeah, I suppose Sandra Bullock is Miss Ethnicity, right? Well, no, all I'm saying is that the whole that generalized historical for excluding the African American element. Well, look how you get your PhD in black cinema, sister soldier.
Shardy Sellers here, creator and co-host of the Afro Horror Podcast. Every week, me and screenwriter Chris Courtney Martin will be breaking down some of our favorite horror TV shows and movies that feature black characters. Because we're true millennials, we'll only be covering films from the 1990s on. Sorry, 80 fans. However, we will be joined by some kick-ass guests, including Deep Blue Sea screenwriter Wayne Powers and the Purge franchise hero Edwin Hodges. Make sure to subscribe to our show so you don't miss an episode. As Tony Todd says, I'll be seeing you.